today's video we're going to be talking about the IBM Aptiva model 2176. We got 20 minute videos on old technology, computers, laser discs, and some CDs. We got two little dogs licking their balls on the screen. And now it's time for the show. Alright ladies and gentlemen. Today's video is going to be about this kind of unremarkable machine, the IBM Aptiva 2176. Uh, there's, I mean, it's nothing super special about this thing. It's an IBM. People tend to love IBM. Mm, IBM. Mm, international business machines. But I think there's enough kind of weird quirks about this machine to keep this video somewhat interesting. Um, there's a few... I don't know if they're going to call them distinctions, but things about this machine here we can talk about that are interesting. Uh, if you're wondering why this unsightly pillow is here, it's because, you know, it's the infamous uh, bed table. So it's squishy and things, the weight shifts it, and I have to put that pillow there to make it sort of level, even though it's probably still a little crooked. Uh, anyways, before we get into the video, I want to make you guys aware of another YouTuber. He's my friend Jack. Uh, if you like to learn more about this computer, sort of, uh, check out his video, uh, Why Do You Have This Computer Reviews. He does a re review on this exact computer. So, uh, his videos are a lot shorter than mine. Uh, they, they take more of a comedic approach. If you like uh, YouTubers and videos, you know, like regular car reviews, his videos are very similar to that. So, if you want to learn a little bit more uh, on his take on this very same Aptiva machine, and uh, maybe even a little about a man named Sage Genowing, check out his video. I'll have a link in the description, and maybe put a card with a link there. So, uh, actually it's a lot about Sage, and less about the IBM Aptiva. But check it out anyways, he's got a couple videos up. I know he's got more planned for the future, so definitely check his videos out when you are done watching this video. So let's get into it about the IBM Aptiva Model 2176. So this was IBM sort of offering to the home computer market, uh, maybe even the business market a little bit, in the mid and late 90s. Uh, I do remember seeing these around. Uh, they, were, they weren't rare. They were, you know, they were fairly common as far as I can remember. Um, there's nothing super special about them, but this machine does have some weird design choices about it. <laughs> There's some interesting things we're going to look at. But, yeah, I mean, IBM, at this point, I don't remember IBM really having the clout that it used to. I, I think the company itself was fine. I don't know really their financial standings in the mid and late 90s. Sure, they're still fine. I believe they're fine today, but they weren't really doing so great in kind of like the home computer market that was just taken over by other IBM compatible uh, makers. You know, people, when you thought of a, a PC, a home PC, you thought of like Dell or HP, maybe even Packard Bell, uh, Hewlett Packard, those guys. You didn't really think so much about IBM. It wasn't like, I'm going to go get a home computer, I'm going to get it on an IBM. It wasn't really that anymore, at least from what I remember. Uh, but this was this was what IBM was offering in the uh, mid late 90s. So we're going to take a look at this guy here. Uh, the case is kind of nice. I mean, you've got your standard beige of the time, of course, but aesthetically, it's a little bit different, kind of pleasing. We have our power button right here. Uh, this is an AT power supply. You can nice click to it. Um, power light, and I think the other one is a activity light for the hard drive, got your nice IBM badge, Aptiva, you know, it's it's nice, it's nice design. You have this here, this is actually a handle, um, it's fairly sturdy, I don't really feel like it's going to snap off when I'm carrying this thing around, it's still awkward because it's, you know, here and there's weight in the back and it's it's a little awkward, but it's it's not bad, It's it's nice to have, I guess, it's a nice option thrown in. So to take a look at the drives, we have this little, I guess, drive shield here. They had this on um, the earlier IBMs too, the types, blah, 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 <laughs> that I think they were still making when they put this out too. I think those lines were sort of 
uh, side by side with those desktops. Uh, but it's uh, it's kind of cool. So you press this button and it slides down, and I believe it's meant to slide down in a nice molasses slow uh, speed. But it's still kind of cool. So you just you just hit this button, and you think your first thought is when you hit the button, it's just it just drops. But it's nice slow. Look at it. Mm, it's just kind of satisfying. And there it reveals your drives. You have a, this is just a standard floppy drive. I guess you could put a zip drive or whatever here. Um, 1.44 megabyte. We have a five and a quarter inch bay here. CD drive. Uh, I believe this came standard with an eight speed CD-ROM drive. And I think this might be the original uh, CD-ROM drive at eight speed, but I'm not sure. And then this, this is kind of annoying. Um, there's a little piece here. It's real kind of loose. Uh, you know, over time, this thing has kind of worked loose. And there's supposed to be little plastic tabs. And they've kind of broke. So uh, it's a little bit... Sometimes, when I first got this thing, these were like crooked. And they kind of were falling out all the time. So when you take the case off, there's this weird, like, bezel piece here uh, that's really loose. And um, it's just really strange. It's I think this is you. You could probably put like a zip drive or something like a three and a half inch drive. But how this uh, kind of goes in there is like really kind of odd. And then there's this piece. And I think at one point those tabs they're kind of smashed and broken. And I, I'm guessing they used to kind of hold it in a lot better. But let me. But with the age and the plastic and stuff, yeah, it's just really loose and awkward. So I'm probably going to have to, I don't have plans to put a drive here. So I'm going to try to maybe super glue this down a little bit. So it's a little more, it doesn't like fall apart and fall out every time I open or mess with the case. Maybe it'll look a little bit better. Yeah, I don't really like that. It's kind of weird and cheap. But it's really, you know, whatever. So that is the front of this machine. And it just, you just kind of want to gently... Yeah, it's very nice. Kind of, kind of elegant. Um, so let's take a look at the back of this thing. All right, so let's take a look at the back of this bad boy IBM Aptiva. Um, got an indent for some reason. Okay, now I get it. You know, the video is already actually. I shot it and I edited it and it was it's ready to post and I, and it just dawned on me what this indent thing in the back is. It's it, it's to help carry it, see? Put your hand on the handle, put your hand in the indent, and, and I mean, it works okay. Just realize that. Uh, power supply right here. Uh, this little interesting thing, this is for a 12-volt, uh, external 12-volt connector. Or um, right here you have this little thing. This is for a speaker, a powered speaker. And I, I think this came with... Uh, speakers but there are also some speakers at the time that instead of using you know another uh, plug you could plug it in right here to the computer and the computer itself will power your speakers it's kind of neat um, I, I don't think I've ever seen that before but it's still kind of neat um, uh, well you know when you see all your IO ports and stuff lined up like this you know you're in for a wacky OEM uh, motherboard inside. Uh, this is it's not the standard form factor here. A couple other OEM machines I remember did this where they're just kinda they're just lined up like one at a time in a line rather than your usual you know right here on a, a rectangle and you had an like an IO plate. Um, so not a standard motherboard you can tell right off the bat. Uh, we have our two PS2 ports for mouse and keyboard although they're on this machine they haven't been color-coded yet as uh, orange and purple. Uh, here we have a uh, serial, I believe, labeled A. Actually a USB port. Uh, I believe this might be USB 1 or 1.1, 1 .1, uh, but it might be just USB 1. As far as I know, this is one of the earliest OEM machines to come standard with USB. And yes, it does work. I have tested it. Uh, the previous owner, for whatever reason, has Windows Me installed in here on here and um, yes this USB port does work so yeah uh, printer port and here is built-in video 
Uh, lots of expansion ports here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So a lot of expansion ports here, although they might not all be uh, have a actual slot uh, lined up with them. Uh, but yeah, uh, it looks like all that's on here right now is a Ethernet card and a very generic looking sound card. But we'll see it's it's kind of generic uh, and it has a like a modem with it. So uh, this card's actually pretty interesting and uh, it's, it's also very horrible. So let's open this guy up and take a look inside. So there's two screws here and here, and when you unscrew these, this whole like case it slides forward off, and it reveals your innards of your Aptiva. So uh, up here we have the hard drive. I think this is the original hard drive, yeah, 96. Uh, these are pretty slow. Uh, from I don't know what the speed is exactly on these or anything, but uh, it's 3.2 gigabytes. Uh, it's an IBM model. Well, there's the model number. These are, from what I've read and the little bit of time I've had with this machine, these are pretty slow and noisy drives. If you have one of these, you might want to replace this unless you're going for an original setup here. All right, let me, let's take a look. And weirdness. Already we see some weirdness. I'm going to get uh, some of this crap out of the way and we'll take a better look. Uh, they're all uh, I, the regular why, why can't they all just use Phillips head screws I just uh. okay so here is the inside of the Aptiva and we're looking at the motherboard and it's a little bit strange uh, the strangest part uh, right off the bat is this sort of riser card or daughter board uh, I guess it would be more of a riser card for all your expansion slots and it also has a little aux connector so there's your power AT power but it also has this aux power connector going to this daughter board which I assume is only there to facilitate this weird the kind of OEM like all our IOs are in a line sort of thing uh, I, I don't really see a point uh, for it other than that it's, it's also weird in the respect that uh, this is a Pentium board I believe it's socket 7 I believe and it only has two PCI slots, and it's sandwiched between 16-bit ISA slots. It's just weird because even the earliest boards that I know of, the 486 boards with PCI slots, it, it, as far as I know, those all of those boards at least had three PCI slots. And this one only has two, and then it has all these 16-bit ISA slots, and it's, it's weird. Uh, I can't think of another machine where the PCI slots are like sandwiched between two sets of... ISA slots. It's just, I mean, it, it doesn't really affect too much except that, you know, you have a penny board and you only have room for two PCI slots. Uh, and if you want to do something like SLI with like a Voodoo 2, it might, you know, cause some issues because, you know, you only have two PCI slots. So it's just, it's a little bit weird for a Pentium class machine. Uh, right here is the little, that's where that connects to that, uh, that speaker power connector. So, or the speaker and I don't I don't know what you call that little white thing does something with the power um, so here we have the chipset it's a VX chipset uh, Intel here's our I believe this is our power mod our VRM a voltage regulating module which you can pull this out and put in another one uh, I've had boards earlier Pentium boards have these uh, here is the socket, which I'm pretty sure this is socket 7. I know the CPU uh, installed right now is a Pentium 166, just a heat sink. It's a, it's a pretty buff heat sink, but there's no fan on it. It seems to work just fine. So yeah, this is a non-MMX Pentium 166. I'm just going to leave that in there. Here we have our slot for our coast module for L2 cache, which is we have one currently installed. I believe this is 256 kilobytes, uh, but this machine from the spec sheet at least says that it will also accept 512 kilobyte coast module stick. Here's our RAM and we have four slots for 72 pin RAM. I believe right now there is 32 megabytes installed and you also have one for uh, SD RAM 168 pin I believe and which is I don't even know if you'd have to get a low profile stick because it might this goes under where this 
riser card is, and if your ram stick's too tall, it's not going to fit. I uh, believe the total this can take is 128 megabytes. So, a uh, little piezo speaker beeper. Here's our case fan. And um, that's, oh, we have a, there's another aux power connector right there too. So, I guess you're also going to need a, uh, maybe a proprietary power supply, maybe? I mean, this form factor looks normal, but you've got regular AT, and then you've got two weird aux connectors, so that's inconvenient if something should happen. Uh, I, I hate inconveniences with power supplies. Okay, well, I'm going to try to remove this daughter board and take a peek what's underneath. Okay, so here is the riser card removed. Sorry, I keep calling it a daughter board. It's just one screw that, let's see, it's like that. Yeah, it's just one screw there, and then it just pops off and connects with a slot here. And they have just these edge, it, this is how it came out, but these aren't, these are just... This will come out. There's just edge connectors. It's kind of goofy and cheap. Um, see on the back of the riser card, those two, those, they just come out. They're just little, they're just pieces. See? I, I don't know. It's kind of goofy and cheap or whatever, but I guess that's, uh, see, just came out. I guess I don't know how else they would have done it. But, um, yeah. Stupid little riser card, <laughs> and uh, underneath it, it's not too interesting. More chips, more of the chipset. Uh, we do have the video chip right here, which you probably can't make out the writing on it because of the lighting, but it is a ATI Rage chip. It's an okay chip for 1996. It's basically the Mach 64 GT 2D core thrown in with a little bit of 3D capabilities and some MPEG-1 decoding. Uh, I believe it does uh, ATI's proprietary API SIF, I believe it's called. Uh, a couple games support that. Uh, don't quote me on that, though, but I, I think that chip does support that. Uh, but still, it's, it's, it's okay. It's not super exciting, but it should do the job for 1996. But at least you've got, you know, a PCI slot to uh, upgrade your video card if you so choose to. It's just two PCI slots. And, I mean, I guess you could you could do two Voodoo 2s SLI with the um, with the ATI chip, although I don't think that chip is known for its great DOS compatibility, and that still would have been a major factor in, you know, 1996, even maybe 1997 a little bit, uh, depending on your tastes. Um, yeah, there's that. Not much else to show on this thing. Um, there's our IDE right there guessing it's like ATA 33 probably uh, I don't know for sure and um, yep that's that that's the inside of this thing so I'm gonna put it back together and just fire it up and then that uh, probably be the end of our video here on the Aptiva so I took off the heat sink uh, here just just to peek at it uh, so like I said this is our non MMX Pentium 166 I think that's what it is when I checked, unless my memory's completely going. And um, I was kind of surprised the the thermal paste looks okay. It's not like really old and crusted. It doesn't look like 20-some-year-old thermal paste. I mean, it looks like cheap thermal paste, but it's pretty viscous. Uh, so I think maybe in recent years, maybe the previous owner uh, maybe changed the CPU or at least applied new thermal paste for whatever reason so yeah that's that's interesting oh is ibm playing its games again with its slightly not standard ram i have this stick here it's 128 megabytes of pc 66 uh 168 pin ram and it it, it almost fits but it doesn't quite fit it just one of the things are a little bit offset that it won't connect, uh, it won't go in right, it won't seat right, and that makes me remember, I believe I had the same sort of problem with RAM in that uh, other desktop IBM I had from around the same time period, and yeah, silly IBM, uh, and it's like slightly not standard RAM, I don't, I don't know if I have any RAM that would work 
it's that particular form factor, I guess. <sighs> okay. Throw all this RAM, and none of it will seat properly in this. And yes, I know some of it's DDR. I just have a bag of RAM. A lot of it's SD RAM, and just none of it will seat properly. So, ugh, IBM, you, you scamps. Um, I guess I'll just leave whatever, or I'll just add two more 72-pin RAM sticks. So there are only two expansion cards in this machine here. Uh, first is this Ethernet card. I don't know if this was came with it, or this is, was probably installed... Uh, later by a previous user. Nothing special. I don't network with these old machines, so I usually just throw these cards like this out. Uh, they're not very useful to me. And the other card is a little more interesting, and that's the sound modem card. This is the kind of infamous uh, IBM M-Wave sound card. Now, right now it has something connected here and here, uh, which go to various places so I'm gonna disconnect those and then we're gonna take a look at this uh, infamous interesting board so here it is the IBM M wave and uh, this came in many earlier Aptivas this is the Dolphin this one's known as Dolphin um, there was a later plug-and-play version I believe known as the Stingray and uh, these are modem slash sound cards and the modem part is kind of interesting because it was upgradable via software I believe it was 28 point something baud and there was a software update that turned it to 33.3 um, I think that's kilobytes baud it's been a while since I've worked with modems um, so yeah I mean that's kind of interesting but um, this card is infamously bad the, there's no FM chip on it the Sound Blaster emulation was pretty bad, as far as uh, I can tell on the internet. Um, it has sort of a MIDI ability to it, but it's not that great. Uh, the drivers are extremely hard to find, um, and there's like a dual process where you have to install the drivers just to get kind of like the basic Windows sound system working, and then there's like a separate install for... Um, enabling the MIDI capabilities, which I hear aren't that wonderful. And um, this card was so bad, there's actually a class action lawsuit against IBM for this. And, um, you know, they eventually start offering to uh, replace this card in, in machines, and then they just stop using it more or less altogether. Uh, people just had a lot of problems with, uh, you know, using, like, either it, the sound would drop out, or the modem would stop working, or they would both have issues. And um, sometimes they would, you know, if if it was using the modem part, the sound would kind of lock up or stop. Uh, I even read, you know, instances where AOL uh, on the internet, like you're you're getting email and you've got the the you got mail part, and it would hang for a long time. It's just this thing is kind of infamously bad, and and any smart user would probably uninstall this thing immediately and put in a different sound card. But I'm gonna try to. To use it, um, I, I at least I mean I don't have the Aptiva disc with the drivers on it, which is going to make it difficult. But yeah, I I just want to see if I can get this card working. So yeah, the IBM M Wave Dolphin 16-bit uh, ISA. Just take a closer look. There's the M Wave. I I guess that's the main chip there. I don't know if that controls the MIDI or whatever. We've got some jumpers here. Uh, looks like a crystal sound chip right there. Um, blah, 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 stuff. Alright guys, before we get into showing off some games running on this machine, uh, I want to go over some things again. Uh, I did update the RAM in this machine from 32 megabytes to 64 megabytes via four 72-pin uh, RAM sticks. Uh, the other thing is, remember, when I play my games, I tend to try to really push the system and I, I tend to run my benchmarks and my games at higher settings so if you see a game and you're like hmm, it's running a little choppy uh, just remember you can turn down resolution and turn down the settings and it will probably run a good bit better so that's just how I like to run things um, other than that I just want to go over the video and sound uh, one more time uh, as for the video that uh, ATI mock uh, chip video chip that's in here now, when I talked about it earlier when we were poking around inside, I, I, I kind of said, you know, it's an okay chip. After researching it some more and having some more time with it, it, it it's, I think I was being generous. It's, um, 
it's kind of garbage, uh, but, uh, you know, we got to kind of take it easy on that chip. This Remember, this is 1996. This is one of the early 3D uh, chips. I, I, I hesitate to call it a 3D accelerator. It's really mostly a 2D card with some 3D features kind of thrown in and some MPEG-1 uh, decoding kind of capabilities. It's, it's barely a 3D accelerator card. So with that in mind, you know, we got to be understanding this, this is the beginning here of 3D acceleration. So we can't be too hard on this uh, ATI Rage 3D chip. Uh, but it is kind of, you know, suck-ish. <laughs> um, the next thing I want to talk about is that Dolphin card. I, I did get it running, and I'll show you how I got it running. Uh, some things about it, though. In DOS, I had a lot of trouble with it. Actually, I couldn't get any sound when I'd run something in true DOS with that card. Uh, it's probably fixable. I didn't really set it up for DOS. I have a new job now. I don't have a lot of time for this kind of stuff, at least not as much as I had before. So I didn't really have time to set it up for DOS. Uh, but just quickly trying to go over things, I just I couldn't get it to produce sound when in uh, true DOS mode. But when I would run a DOS game through Windows, I could set it up and I could get sound. Uh, some interesting things though, it, a lot of times when you did the auto-detect, it would auto-detect it as an uh, AW32 or a Sound Blaster 16, and then when you'd run a sound test, it would lock up. But if you manually set the card and set it as a Sound Blaster Pro, and then set it up that way, it seemed to work just fine. Um, even running through Windows though, if it was a DOS game, I just could not get MIDI to work. Uh, I could get MIDI to work on the card if it was in true Windows, so if I was just running in Windows and it was a Windows game, didn't seem to have any problem with MIDI, but if I was running a DOS game through Windows, I couldn't seem to get MIDI, just the FM uh, emulation. So, uh, that's about it. I'm, I'm not really going to give an opinion, I'm not really an audiophile, so I'm not really going to give an opinion on what I thought. Of the, uh, of the FM emulation of this card, or the Sound Blaster emulation. I'll leave that up to you guys. Uh, same thing with its MIDI capabilities. Uh, I didn't really have many games on hand for Windows that had MIDI. Uh, so we've got like Doom 95 uh, with MIDI, and I just have a, a MIDI file that I played, uh, unfortunately. Like I said, I don't have a lot of time, as much time for these videos as I used to, so... But yeah, so I'll uh, leave it up to you guys to decide what you think of the uh, IBM M-Wave Dolphin card. Alright. So there it is, powering up. And it's got a little, you know, sorry for the glare as usual. Uh, got a little IBM logo that pops up. Has its own little pair, fairly limited IBM BIOS. Previous owner has Windows Me loaded on here. so. Uh, what I'm going to do, I'm going to replace Windows Me with Windows 95, just for a little bit more period correctness. Yep, see, there it is. So here's that IBM SurePath uh, setup utility, you know, it's the BIOS, uh, basically, when you hit F1 when you're at the post. Here's our system information. Um, see, it says here we have the 256 uh, KB of L2 cache, it detects that fine. And, um... Yeah, I mean, there's some things you can do here, like under advanced options, I think you can set uh, memory timings, and there's cache options and stuff. So there's a little bit you can do, but it's obviously not as much as uh, some BIOSes. Alright, change of plan. So, um, Windows 95 is kind of a no-go. Uh, I'll let you guys in on a little secret. Uh, I've never gotten USB to work with Windows 95, and um, what I and I've had Windows 95 C on here, which I believe is the like the last version, and it, it had USB support. I thought built in. It was for OEMs. Um, I had it installed on here. I just can't get the USB to work, and I really need the USB to work just because it makes my life so much easier with transferring files and whatnot. Uh, I just don't want to deal with alternative ways. So I reformatted and I did install Windows 98 on the Aptiva. Um, but like I said, I've tried different drivers. I've just never been able to get USB working in Windows 95. I know it can be done. Uh, I just 
I've never been able to successfully do it, but Windows 98, I found USB drivers one day, and they've always worked for me. So now I have uh, USB support. It, it should be virtually the same anyways, although I, I did find a page specifically about Aptivas and upgrading them to Windows 98, because apparently there's some issues and incompatibilities involved, which I don't quite understand, because there's really nothing proprietary in this thing. It's just kind of weird, like design-wise and how where things are, but like it's not using like really weird components except maybe that M-Wave, which I think might be a lot of the problems uh, in Windows 98. But so far, it's it's working fine, and um, I even have the M-Wave sort of working. So yeah, we're just gonna go with Windows 98. All right, so here we go. Uh, this is just CPUZ running, uh, just to show you guys. Uh, also, I'd like to point out that. When we get a little bit later into this, the image quality goes down. For some reason, the capture method I'm using here was not jiving with audio, so I had to use a different method. It's I'm used to it by now. It's just my luck with video capture and audio. It, it's always crap for me for some reason. But anyways, uh, yeah, so there's just a little look at this. Now, about the M-Wave, um, there are a lot of links online. I found a lot of old website that has links. There's like seven discs to install, and then there's an all-in-one package and all that, but uh, pretty much all of them that I came across just were, were dead links. Uh, and that is when I discovered you can actually get the drivers off the Windows 98 CD. Now, I don't think they're on the Windows 95 CD. They might be, but that might have been a little too early. But you can get them off the Windows 98 CD, which I will show you now. So here we are you just well first I'll show you that I do have it uh, indeed installed so right now I already have the M-Wave Dolphin installed uh, so I will show you that down in device manager and there we go and it's actually installed it comes up two places if you see up near the top it says IBM M-Wave digital signal processors and then we have under sound video and game controllers we have more M-Wave stuff, and um, there's a Sound Blaster compatible uh, game port joystick, but I don't think there is a joystick port on it, but anyways, yeah, it uh, installed there just fine on my system, and I will show you how I did that. So what you want to do is, of course, install, insert your Windows 98 CD and go to Add New Hardware, and then when you get here, you go to Next and click next again. Now it didn't show up at all at first because it's not plug and play. Windows didn't see it at all. It wasn't even showing up as like a, un, like a device with a little exclamation mark. So you go to manually search and then you go down this it says IBM M-Wave digital thing up there but I think I don't remember that being there before. It might be because I installed it. Anyways you go to other devices click next then it very slowly goes to another, so there we go. And then you look for IBM in the window on the left. There it is, IBM. And then that opens up more options on the right. And then you go down and I actually think it says like IBM M-Wave Dolphin. There's another one too, which I believe is for the modem. I didn't install the modem drivers just because it wasn't necessary and it probably just caused more problems. Uh, but this is where I found the audio drivers for like a little bit of the MIDI capabilities and um, like just your general sounds and uh, sound blaster emulation and there it is right there IBM Dolphin M-Wave DSP adapter and then you just install those drivers from there now the part for MIDI I just kind of found on the internet and it was a file uh, now originally from the readme it was supposed to have an like an installer or a setup uh, like EXE. Mine didn't have one, uh, so I just kind of took the file and I read where it was supposed to go and I just plopped it down where it was supposed to go on the C drive and uh, it kind of works as far as I can tell, at least in Windows. So M-Wave, it goes right there, just right on your C drive and then that samples folder and then uh, MIDI Med, I think it says there, and then there you go with all the little samples. And uh, so far, at least in Windows, it seems to have worked for me and uh, I'll give you an example here in a minute I will play a MIDI file uh, and I will show you what it sounded like actually before I dropped that little MIDI sample folder into Windows
and this is after I installed that MIDI folder, and no, I didn't mess with the volume, it was just low before. Now let's look at some uh, gameplay on this thing with the 3D Rage and the M-Wave. And here is Commander Keen, Goodbye Galaxy. I like to use this game to test uh, some video cards, and as you can see there is a lot of jitteriness here with that 3D Rage. Now there is an option to do VGA smoothing and to try to fix that, but for this chip it did not work. I tried it with and without those options enabled. Here I have them enabled to fix jerky motion and SVGA compatibility, and it did not solve the problem. Thank <laughs> you. 
And here's the Tomb Raider 2 demo, which gave me some graphical issues. If you look at Laura, uh, it looks like she's completely covered in dust. Uh, also, some of the enemies kind of had the same graphical issue. Here's Shogo, which actually ran a little better than I expected to, but not that it actually ran well, but just better than I initially expected. Uh, so what is my personal opinion on the IBM Aptiva? Well, it doesn't do anything particularly bad for a computer of the era. It doesn't do anything particularly good or different. I mean, it has it has some a bit of a different style to it. Um, the case is nice. The handle's nice. I find myself liking this stupid cover that slowly slides down to reveal the drives. Uh, you know, there's some annoyances with it, uh, how the the SDRAM slot is, like, slightly different, where it's really picky about what kind of RAM stick it will accept. It's annoying. The proprietary-ish power supply is annoying. Uh, the, the motherboard little riser thing, it, it's fine. It doesn't really change anything, except that it's a riser instead of just right on the board. That That's fine, whatever, but... I, I would like some more PCI slots for a Pentium class motherboard, uh, a Socket 7 motherboard. It, it should have at least three PCI slots. It's a little weird um, that it only has two. Uh, I mean, whatever. I guess you don't really need more than that. But, I mean, if you, if you want to use this as kind of like more of a Windows 98 uh, board, I mean, more PCI would help. Uh, you could put in a faster IDE controller and then, you know, maybe... You know, you want a PCI audio card and then a PCI video card. It would it would help. 
Uh, but I guess it's not it's not too horrible to only have two, but more would be nice. So yeah, it's it's okay. There's there's better options, but I know some people really love IBM. Um, personally, I I like the the I can't think of the model number, but the you know the IBM personal computer that's a desktop from around the same era. It just had more PCI slots, and it wasn't quite as proprietary. Uh, not that this is proprietary, but it just has its quirks with the design. But So the one thing I would say about this machine, if you're seriously thinking about using an Aptiva like this as your main retro rig, either for DOS or Windows 95, 98, Windows 3.1, uh, for this particular machine, I would definitely think about upgrading or changing uh, your stock video and sound. The uh, Rage 3D chip, like I said, it's barely a 3D accelerator. There's just better options. Uh, it, it, it's pretty weak. Uh, I, like I said, it's okay. It is okay. But I mean, like 2D stuff, it will get you by. Some compatibility issues in DOS, but it, it will get you by. Windows, early Windows, you know, 2D stuff, meh. For DOS, maybe throw in a Verge. Throw in a Verge GX or something like that if you're doing DOS for compatibility. Um, and if you're doing Windows, there's so many better options. Throw in a PCI Voodoo 3 or uh, you know anything really. Uh, you want to stick with Rage, go with the Rage 128 or uh, go with a, uh, NVIDIA uh, Riva 128, uh, I think they call it, or a TNT or a TNT2 or anything uh, is probably you know better than that that Rage because it's just kind of an in-between chip. It's like decent 3D but it's not, or, you know, not decent 3D. It's like decent 2D or okay 2D and it's like not really much of a 3D chip, so just just replace that if you're seriously thinking of using this as your main retro rig. So as for the M-Wave, uh, the Dolphin card in there, it's it wasn't as bad as I thought it would be, and I, I know I couldn't get it working in pure DOS, but I'm sure it can be made to work in pure DOS, but still, there's just a lot of options with just better options. I, I think probably most users had issues with it because they were using it both as a modem and a sound card at the same time, and I guess that's where a lot of problems come in with that card, although it does seem to have issues just being a sound card or just being a modem, but just, if you're doing DOS, just throw in an AW32 if you can find one, or Sound Blaster 16. Uh, if you're doing Windows, you know, AW is still good. Throw in anything with like a Vortex 2 chip on it. Um, you know, there, there's plenty of options there that are better than the M-Wave, so this makes a pretty decent uh, retro machine if you, you know, change the video card, change the sound card. And you've got some leeway with that CPU. Uh, I have 166 in here, which I think is a pretty good uh, CPU for early Windows and, and DOS stuff. Uh, you could put in a, a slower one, uh, I think down to like a 75 megahertz. You can put it at 200 megahertz, MMX, Pentium if you want. Or, you know, you go weird, Cyrix or uh, AMD. So, yeah, it, it's it's okay. It can be made a decent uh, kind of retro rig, especially if you're into IBM stuff. It's it's okay. It's it's all right. It's not horrible. It's not great. It's just it's just an IBM Aptiva.